second part of a webcast lecture about the Romantic movement, and I want to explore the key idea of sensibility, a supposed aptitude for the subjective, emotional appreciation of a higher truth, normally through poetry and art. And there's an associated proneness to the emotion of what we would call these days empathy, a concern for the feeling of others, especially for their suffering. Amongst the categories of those who suffer are, for, for the Romantics, are the poor. Um, and the movement generally held that the poor had more virtue than the rich, that becoming wealthy and becoming civilised tend to, tended to corrupt the human character, and that the poor, the unsophisticated, the pre-civilised, uh, but also the peasantry, uh, dwellers in the countryside, were purer, uh, led more authentic lives and were less corrupt. Now this admiration for the poor, I think, did feed into the socialist movement of the late 19th century and the 20th century with the idea of redistributing wealth and power from the rich to the poor. But in Romanticism, that's only one trend and it's a rather a minor trend. For the Romantics, it did not follow necessarily that the rich should give their money to the poor. In fact, there's a sense in which helping the poor or suffering is actually an insult to them because it removes the blessed wretchedness of their poverty uh, or illness, uh, the very thing that opens them up to uh, sensibility. And the aesthetic appreciation of the troubles and sufferings of others forms part of the romantic outlook, certainly, especially the outlook of that part of the movement which is identifiably Christian. And this would include the religious revival noticeable right across Europe from the 1820s onwards. Poverty was associated with rural life and the life of the self-sufficient peasant on the edge of destitution uh, engaged in a struggle for survival against the odds, a struggle against fate and a struggle against nature. Uh, the peasant had no insulation from uh, the trappings of civilization and was thus an heroic and honest figure living an authentic life full of simplicity and virtue in contrast to the corrupt inhabitants of the rapidly expanding and disease-ridden cities of those times. The suffering and authenticity of the peasant was mirrored by the suffering of Christ on the cross, since Romanticism in one of its forms engaged a re religious revival which was intensely centred on Christ's personal suffering uh, during the crucifixion story. In this way, as in so many others, Romanticism is a rebellion against the restraint and refined taste of the 18th century, the 1700s, um, which in itself uh, was a reaction against the passions and enthusiasms and extremism of the wars of religion in England, the Civil War, Puritanism and Cromwell. And so it's the negation of neg the negation. If we take, in Hegelian terms, our starting point as the enthusiasm and the religious fanaticism, really, of the wars of religion in the 16th and 17th centuries, then the Enlightenment is a reaction against that, and Romanticism is a reaction against that reaction. Um, in the Augustinian age, that was the age of the Enlightenment, so-called Augustinian age because the French monarchs likened themselves to Caesar Augustus, creating a new, a new great age of Greco-Roman civilization in Europe, and very consciously imitating that, in fact, in the Augustinian age of the Enlightenment, of the Palace of Versailles, of um, the, the uh, liberal trends leading up to liberal and progressive trends leading up to the French Revolution. In this Augustinian age, before Romanticism, says Bertrand Russell, the model for both good government and for personal morality and manners was restraint uh, and avoidance of religious enthusiasm or extremism of any, any sort. This was associated with extremely uh, elaborate etiquette and polite manners.
um, of the sort that we read about when we were looking at Addison and Steele. Um, and Romanticism is completely against this. The Romantics, in contrast, reject the urbanity, uh, the blandness of a civilised urban life. They don't like hierarchy, which of course is, is an inevitable result of people living close together in a city. They don't like hierarchy, they don't like order, they don't like taste and fashion. Uh, in, in the sense of high fashion uh, of, of, the, um, of the Augustinian age. Rousseau himself, uh, who were taking from Russell as one of the founders of the Romantic movement, Rousseau himself lived much of his life as a tramp, uh, and he admired the natural lifestyle of the North American Indians. Dr. Johnson, uh, in contrast, before Rousseau, an Enlightenment figure, disliked the countryside so much that when he was uh, travelling through the Lake District, um, he had cur special curtains installed in his carriage um, so he wouldn't have to look at this sort of jumble of boulders and rocks and you know, untidy natural phenomena. Um, he was an archetypal man of the Enlightenment, pre-Romantic. He liked order, symmetry, he liked his countryside to be manicured and designed uh, in line with the principles of geometry and rationality. Much preferred the manicured gardens and Baroque ornamentation of the English stately homes with their ordered gardens to the unsightly chaos of mountains, boulders uh, and uh, the countryside. He much preferred the ornate fountain uh, and reflecting ornamental lakes of stately homes to waterfalls, streams, and natural phenomena of any sort. Uh, Dr. Johnson said that if a man was tired of London, then he was tired of life. He simply couldn't understand why anyone would in embrace what he called the idiocy of rural life. The idiocy, idiocy in, and you'd have to add poverty of rural life. In the age of the Romantics, mountains, clouds and unrestrained nature were worshipped, especially in the arts of poetry and of painting. Uh, urban life was scorned, crowds were abhorred, uh, and all of this was replaced with the cult of the solitary wandering mind, uh, who uh, wandering about o'er the fields and o'er the mountain peaks, um, just there to, to reflect the some of the style of the poetry. Uh, in England, the trend is most evident in the life and writings of the English Lake District poets, the Lakeland poets. Uh, Wordsworth, the leading poet of that school, lived in a type of uh, self-imposed poverty, however genteel, uh, in a cottage, uh, and wrote so, uh, and wrote of sudden noumenal births of bliss at the sight, sight of clouds of daffodils uh, growing high in the mountains, in a position significantly where they would never normally be viewed or perceived by any creature with sufficient sensibility to appreciate their beauty. Now this kind of tragic element is, is what about flowers is something I've noticed in Romantic poetry. The German Romantic poet Goethe is uh, one of his themes is about flowers that grow uh, in the shade of mountains and so on forth and therefore are never seen, never reach their full potential, etc. etc. Um, the idea of beauty existing uh, in a realm where it won't be viewed is, and, and the kind of tragi tragedy that that entails, very, very characteristic of the, characteristic of the Romantics. And those of you who've heard a little bit about Kant or read a little bit about Kant will also understand the, the preoccupation of those times with the idea of the unperceived object. Now, when Wordsworth is talking about suddenly being shocked uh, with a kind of blister.